Okay. So while we're still welcoming folks, um, I thought maybe I can do a little housekeeping and introduction. We, I do wanted to get started at the top of the hour, so we stay on time. I know time is precious and want to be definitely respectful of that, um, and especially for our subject matter expert, too, also who has um, a full-time job as well, so let's just make keep it on time. So thank you again for being here. My name is Elena Boyer. I am Director of Implementation Research at the Council. Um, and we have an introduction slide. So I will, uh, when we get to that slide, I'll hand it off to others to introduce themselves. But again, thank you for being here. The title of our presentation today is Pathways to Peace, an Introduction to Workplace and Other Wellness um, Concepts. And our presenter today will be Shantae Gamby. So as people are getting situated into the room, you are welcome to rename yourself, whatever you feel most comfortable with. You can use your name. You can let us know your organization. Where are you joining us from? You can put that in the chat as well. We always love introductions. And if you would like to change your pronouns, you are welcome to do so. The way you do that is you click on your picture on the Zoom screen and three dots will pop up. Those three dots will open a menu and you just click rename and you can rename it to whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, just to give you a heads up about some engagement over the next hour and a half, we will be using possibly breakout rooms. We'll see how many are able to join us today. Otherwise, a great small intimate group is also a great way to have um, small group discussions. So potential breakout rooms as well as um, potential, or we will be using Mentimeter as well. So you might want to have your phone ready or be able to access um, the internet. That would be great. We'd love to hear from you all today. So I just want to begin with our HRSA acknowledgement, our disclaimer. Um, this is one of our activities in our health res resources, services, and administration work plans. This is a learning series and is supported by HRSA um, of the U.S., Department of Health and Human Services, part of an award totaling nearly $2 million and with 0% financed with non-government sources. The information or content and conclusions are those of the presenters and should not be construed as the official position or policy of, nor should any endorsements be inferred by HRSA, HHS, or the government. So today, our council hosts are, again, myself. I already introduced myself. Again, thank you for being here. Um, and we have Darlene. Darlene, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Welcome. Glad you joined us today. Great. And then we also have our fearless tech leader, who I always like to just try to raise awareness to those who might be behind the scenes that are making all of this happen. So I appreciate Brandon Dela Cruz, who is our media technology manager for helping and supporting us. Brandon, I'll leave it up to you if you want to unmute, <laughs> if you feel comfortable uh, saying hi. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you. So if any time during this um, webinar you are having any technical problems, reach out to either of us in the chat and we're happy to help you. So today I just wanted to give a little background about why we created this series. So we had a um, session at our conference last year, a national conference, where we really opened it up to hear from clinicians of color and kind of hear what are the challenges? What is work like? What are some wellness um, ideas or practices that they might use, that they might be able to share with other peers or colleagues. And then it just seemed to be a place where people just needed that space to share um, and talk about their experiences. And it was a really great um, session where people felt safe and comfortable in order to do so. So we wanted to continue that on with this series. And so this is kind of the, the justification or the reason that we presented um, our having this series. And it's just acknowledging that People of color that are employed at health centers experience different types of um, racism, either in microaggressions, um, implicit biases daily, and it can lead to a lot of traumatic stress and feelings of hurt and a sense of loneliness, even while working in a crowded, busy environment. And it's really difficult, I'm sure, for providers, too, who their main clients are patients where they need to be devoting a lot of their time to. Um, so the Council, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, recognized this need and to provide a safe space for persons of color to promote healing. We certainly welcome all of our allies in this space. It'd be great to learn how to support your um, BIPOC or your persons of color within your um, organization as well. So thank you for being here. We appreciate your participation. Um, I will leave it up to Shantae when she opens her slides to do her 
background and her experience. We are so lucky to have met her. Um, Shante was one of the attendees in that session. So if you're welcome to reflect on that as well. Um, if, if you would like, but she is the founder of Fringe Counseling, Coaching and Consulting. And um, I will hand it off to her to let her um, share a little bit more about her. But before I do so, I do wanna let you know that we do have some future sessions. So even if you weren't available to attend this session or if you have colleagues that you think would really like to participate in this, we have a couple of up upcoming opportunities for you to participate. So today, of course, we're gonna do an introduction level to wellness. And then in February, we will do a little bit of a deeper dive um, into wellness and the culture around safety within the workplace as well. It'll also be guided by Shantae Gamby. And then lastly, we have a final way to, um, to engage with us at our national conference in 2023, which will be in Baltimore, Maryland. We have a pre-conference institute, which is really devoted to almost, I believe close to seven hours of um, just great learning, sharing, promising practices, just a really great space to continue that learning experience. So we really look forward to you to engaging in these future opportunities. Those that did register, we do hope that we can engage you between these sessions by either um, getting ways for us to communicate uh, and share experiences that we might be able to use or um, focus on in our following um, session as well. And it'll also give us an opportunity to hear back from you all and get feedback around how you feel in this space. Was this what you were looking for? So we're definitely looking forward to being able to engage in between sessions as well. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Shantae. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining today. I mean, on a Friday afternoon to come together for a webinar is a big thing. And I know working in healthcare settings, you all have a lot of other things you could be doing. So I hope this will prove to be well worth your time. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, okay. Okay, and. There we go. Okay. Um, so once again, uh, thank you all for joining. And I'd like to thank the council for, and Alina and Darlene for working with me and choosing uh, to partner with me to bring you all uh, these wellness workshops. And this one is going to be an introduction to workplace wellness and wellness in general, particularly for Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, to determine their own pathway. So it's introductory, but we're going to start here. And then um, if you can join us for the other ones, that would be great because these are going to build upon each other. But this is where we are today. So, so my name is Shante Gamby. I am a licensed clinical social worker in Chicago. And as Elena mentioned, I have uh, my private practice where I do consulting work uh, and also racial equity work with organizations as well as individual therapy. Most of my clients are identify as BIPOC and also work within either the healthcare sector or education. And so I really try to focus on supporting um, communities and building that health equity. And I also do that in my full-time job uh, where I serve as an administrator for a, a healthcare system here in Chicago. So to get started, I just want to acknowledge that the land that Chicago sits on was and remains native land. Um, there, there were many indigenous tribes here prior to us and many continue to reside here and this is their land. So I just think it's, always important to acknowledge that and also um, call to power um, that as well. So, and if you haven't heard about land acknowledgements before, uh, I believe you all will get copies of the slides. Uh, so that's just a link to a discussion about that as well. So I have a couple of objectives for today. 
And I'm going to, I am very much a presenter that likes things to be very interactive. And, you know, I want to make sure that you all are feeling like this is a good use of your time. So um, I was just telling the team that I may switch things up depending on what works well for you all, because I ultimately want this to be a safe space for you. Um, but I did have a few objectives and hopes for you all in this um, hour and a half we have together. So to start, participants will be able to self-define wellness. I'm gonna talk about different wellness concepts, but ultimately each individual has to define wellness for themselves. So hopefully this will help with that process. Um, and also participants will be able to assess wellness. So I have a couple of wellness tools and resources that will be provided to you all to utilize for that process. And participants will understand how our various environments can impact multiple aspects of our wellness. So today we're gonna to focus primarily on the workplace environment, but wellness happens everywhere. So, as someone who identifies as being highly sensitive, I've done a lot of work around how do we pay attention to our environments in order to influence our own sense of wellness. So I like to also integrate that into my workshops as well. So my intentions for this will, is that this will be a therapeutic safe space. So this isn't going to be group therapy, <laughs> but hopefully it can be a space where people feel comfortable sharing their experiences, um, asking questions, sharing your expertise, um, and just building that community. Uh, I hope that this time will be thought provoking and you know, I don't, I don't ever expect people to agree with all of this, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily always agree with things that people present to me, but I try to make these things interesting and in that maybe it sparks something or you're like, oh, I'd like to consider that more or I totally don't agree with that and this is why. So hopefully it'll be thought provoking and also a bit challenging in a way where it's you're developing a sense of growth in the process. So I would like to know from you all kind of what your hopes are for this time to our time together. So if you could put in the chat what you'd like to get out of this, what your hopes are, that would be really helpful to help guide the conversation today. So I see more awareness to build a framework for wellness as a BIPOC, okay. Definitely going to help work on building that framework. Anybody else? And if you want, you can come off mute. <laughs> How to be intentional about creating wellness and space with others who are not BIPOC. Ooh, yes, okay. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Learning new wellness skills to workplace trauma? Yes, yes. So we're gonna talk about some of what I like to call workplace hazards, which um, can be triggering for folks um, from a tra trauma lens. All right, I'm seeing some agreement with Debbie's statement. Mm. Yep. All right, well, thank you all. You can continue to add to the chat if anything else comes up. And if any questions come up direct during this presentation, feel free to um, pop them in the chat or you can come off of mute, that's fine too. Um, 
so that we can just have a discussion about these things. So as a therapist, I have a, a model that I tend to follow with most of my clients and it's the think, feel, do framework. So I believe that we tend to be, as human beings, we tend to lean to one of these things, right? Some of us are very much big thinkers. You know, when a problem comes up, we want to problem solve, we want to think about it. Some of us are big feelers. We are very much in touch with how we feel about situations and that influences our behavior. And then some of us are just very much like, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And the, the importance of all of that is we need to be able to think, feel, and do. And so when I do workshops, I like to integrate aspects of all of that. So to start today, we're going to think about wellness, wellness concepts, frameworks. We're going to do some feelings work. And I, I, pre I preface that to say feelings may come up. But the next session is going to be specifically on feelings and um, some of the trauma work with that. So we'll start the conversation today. But if you're really like, I want to dig deeper into how do I identify my own feelings and all of that, that will be a part of the next session. And then we're going to talk about where do we go from here? How do we use what we're learning today? in our workplace and in our lives. Uh -oh. Oh. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, this is an introduction. Um, so some of these things we'll dig into a little deeper later on. Um, but I encourage you all to also lean into certain aspects for yourself. If you say, huh, I've never heard of that before. Um, I'd like some resources on that. Uh, I'll share my contact information so you all can reach out to me for those or, you know, you can do your own research as well. But wellness in general is a newer concept in terms of research. So, so um just kind of keep that in mind that a lot of this will be very introductory and it's that way intentionally. Uh, the other statement that I like to make sure that people are aware of is that wellness probably looks different for each of us. So my idea of wellness may not be the same as yours. And as mentioned earlier, we're going to do a, um, we're going to have a few conversations and my hope is that we can create a safe space as a community to talk about that and create a space where it's okay if our definitions don't perfectly align because we're all different people. And also recognizing it can be really difficult to stay focused on one thing. Um, some of us are in meetings all day staring at screens. Some of us are out in the field a lot and maybe don't necessarily want to stare at a screen. So, so I just ask that you give yourselves, I just ask that you all give yourselves um, the space to acknowledge whatever reactions you're having in your mind, your body, your spirit, and give yourself time to take a break, get something to drink, um, go, you know, get up and walk around if you need to, do whatever you need to do to feel grounded in this space. Okay, so speaking of being interactive, we're going to start um, with defining what is wellness for ourselves. So I believe that you all will get this information in the chat, but if you can go to the website, menti.com, and put in that code, it should lead you to a question and you can actually add words that come up for you when you think about wellness. I am going to see if I can pull up my Minty so we can see how that's going. Does anybody have any questions on that?
Okay, I see words coming up. Let me see if I can share the Minty. Okay. Wellness, wholeness, safety, peace, quiet, alone time, humbled, health, whole. Awareness. Free from worry. Happiness in all aspects. Freedom, health. So if you haven't put one in yet and you'd like to, I'll give you about 30 seconds. We have some great ones up here already, but if anything else is coming to mind, feel free to share. Security. Clarity. Yeah, so these are all really great words and definitely encompassing of what I think of when I think of wellness. Uh, definitely health, right? It is a measurement, just as health is a measurement of whether it be our physical um, status or our mental health status, like health is a measurement and so is wellness. And wellness, when we are able to balance the aspects of it can bring a sense of peace, freedom, calm, safety. So thank you all for doing that. I am going to stop my share for a second and get back to the spreadsheet or the PowerPoint. So, uh -oh. All right. So a few years ago, SAMHSA um, uh, created this, what they call a wellness wheel. So basically this is supposed to be an idea of how do we holistically look at wellness? And so there are several different layers of wellness according to SAMHSA. So I'm going to play a short video clip on that and then I'll describe that in more detail. Let's see. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, created the Wellness Initiative to help people with mental and or substance use disorders, and all people, live longer, healthier lives by focusing on the eight dimensions of wellness that connect all aspects of behavioral health. Improving wellness by taking action on each of these dimensions addresses early mortality from treatable and preventable conditions. Embracing wellness is about life and living and becoming the healthiest you possible. Listen to your feelings, express them to people you trust, and maintain a positive outlook. Make it a point to understand your finances, establish good financial habits, and plan for the future. A sense of belonging and a reliable support system help during difficult times. Make at least one social connection daily. 
seek advice from peers or support groups, and create healthy friendships. Enhancing your connection to self, nature, and others brings balance and peace to your life. Take time to discover what values and beliefs are most important to you. Look for satisfaction from things you're passionate about, whether it is through work, school, or volunteering. Reduce your risk of many illnesses by increasing activity levels according to your abilities, getting restful sleep at night, choosing healthy foods, and exploring outdoors to reduce stress and increase energy levels. Be a lifelong learner by expanding your knowledge and finding creative outlets that stimulate your mind and sense of curiosity. Be open to new ideas, insights, and wisdom. A positive environment has a calming effect. Find surroundings that encourage good physical and mental health and where you also feel safe. At SAMHSA, we envision a future in which people with mental and or substance use disorders and all people pursue optimal health, happiness, recovery, and a full and satisfying life in the community. Wellness is an ongoing pursuit and can be challenging at times, but striving to make small daily improvements is the key to success. For more information and resources about wellness, visit www.samsa.gov slash wellness dash initiative. So I like to share that video just because I think it's a, a great resource for us working in healthcare settings, right? It's, it's something quick um, and something that gives a few suggestions for what wellness might look like. Um, and they do have a whole um, wellness uh, curriculum around that. So if you're interested, definitely check it out on the SAMHSA website. But basically each layer basically has, is about us being able to measure kind of where we are at any given time. So, Emotional wellness, how do we manage stress? How do we identify our feelings? Are we aware of what our feelings are? Um, a lot of work that I do with clients at times is getting them in touch with their feelings. And that, that's often linked to trauma where we've shut down that emotional side sometimes to protect ourselves. So part of the work in developing emotional wellness is to be able to identify those feelings and emotions and utilize them in a way that helps us manage our stress. Uh, financial wellness. So that's satisfaction with current and our future financial situation. So financial wellness to me is making sure where are we financially in terms of today, where are we? But also if something were to happen tomorrow, do we feel like we may be prepared? So how do we create those safety things within the financial um, spectrum of our lives? Social wellness is how connected are we to others, to our communities? That is a key point in, um, and being human, that's a big part of our health. Our mental health is being connected. And along those lines, when I, how many people do we have that we actually feel supported by? So I will have people say, well, I have family or I have coworkers, but I don't talk to them about the things that make me vulnerable. So social wellness, would be how how many people are your actual supports? How do you define your supports? And how often are you connecting with your supports? Spiritual wellness, in short, is finding meaning, finding purpose um, in our existence. So some folks find this through religion. Some folks find this through having their own various beliefs, but this is very important to our mental health as well because what we found is when folks don't feel like they have a sense of purpose, 
it's very hard for them to feel well in other aspects of their life. So um, spirituality is a big part of holistic wellness, occupational wellness, that, that can be linked to job satisfaction and your goals for your job, right? So if I say, I really want a great paying job, I may feel well occupationally if I am able to attain that. But over time, I may also say, well, I actually want to do something that I feel like is giving back to the community. You all as healthcare workers, you do that every day. But it's asking yourself, is this, am I getting personal satisfaction from this? Is this enriching my life in some way? That's the measurement for occupational wellness. Physical wellness is very similar to physical health. Am I eating things that are nurturing to my body? Do I know the positive impacts of food, certain foods on my body and the negative impacts? Also, am I getting enough sleep? How active am I? All of those things help us measure our physical wellness. And then intellectual wellness is how engage, how often are we engaging our minds? So this could be in creative pursuits. This could be um, in logic-minded activities. It could be learning a new skill. Intellectual wellness is also very important too, because not only does it help us perhaps in these other aspects, right? You know, maybe we learn a new skill about how to invest or, and that positively impacts our financial wellness. Or maybe we um, become, we learn more about physical fitness and, you know, maybe we become an instructor. So intellectual wellness actually has the potential to impact a lot of these aspects. And I like the way they actually created the circles to interact in such a way because any of these could also positively impact the other parts. So sometimes it's really hard to get that balance, but sometimes if we can choose to focus on one, we may see benefits in other aspects of wellness. And the last one, last but not least, is environmental wellness. So... This is developing an awareness of our environment. How aware are we of the environment? And also, how aware are we of what feels good within our environment? So for me, for example, I know I really like to be able to be in spaces where there's candles lit and all of that. I like pleasant scents and all of that. So that's part of my environmental wellness plan. Sometimes I'm in spaces where I can't have a candle lit and I still find ways to make that space comfortable for me. So environmental wellness is how we also create those spaces, but also how we interact with the environments, the natural environment, right? Um, are we spending time outdoors in nature? Are we doing things that help us feel like we're preserving the land? Um, so those are things to think about there. Are there any questions? Shantae, this is Elena. I just um, appreciate seeing this visually. I'm a visual person and really appreciating the, the complexity and the interconnectedness, I just put it in the chat of really, cause I think about these sometimes very siloed or I think only mm -hmm. fixing one of these, it's gonna fix my well being. when actually you have to kind of think about all of these aspects, so. Absolutely, thank you for that. And I I think often we do get stuck on a one or two because for various reasons, but I do think we get messages from society, from family, from friends as to what's most important, right? So maybe you grew up in a space where they said being financially well is the most important thing. And then folks say, okay, well, that's what I'm going to focus on. If I can just be financially well enough, 
then I'll be good. But what we find is generally people aren't good <laughs> because there are still other aspects of the human experience that need to be addressed. So yes, they are all very much connected and related. You know, I had never heard the term as far as, or considered even intellectual wellness. Mm -hmm. So that's an aspect that I have, that's just coming to light today, but I, I get it. I really do understand that, that intellectual wellness, um, because a lot of times, like if you're reading a book or something, you think it's more of a physical wellness where you're mm -hmm. relaxing, you know, you're not really concentrating on anything. You just kind of giving yourself a respite. But it is also intellectual wellness, kind of making sure that you're um, expanding knowledge and skills. And that can mm -hmm. be in, in various ways. It could just be play. You know, they, they talk mm -hmm. about how um, uh, as adults, we forget how to play. Right. So that they encourage, you know, we should be encouraged to play and to have fun and just go out and swing or do whatever we want to do, but to really um play and that again can help boost not only some of the physical things but also the intellectual um, wellness that we need absolutely absolutely and that's one of my favorite ones because I like to play video games so <laughs> it's definitely one where I'm like yay I, I am actually working on my wellness but as an adult I agree the idea of play isn't necessarily encouraged but we do know especially, you know, we look at kids, kids play all the time and they're learning as they're playing. That's how they learn how to interact with their environment, with the world around them, with individuals. And as adults, we also need to do the same because we continue to have new problems that pop up. So how are we able to think creatively if we're not engaging ourselves intellectually? So it's a great point. Anything else come up for anybody else? Okay. Oh, thanks for that, Tiffany. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, we are often socialized, like I said, to to choose one or two of these to really focus on for our entire lives, when in all actuality, we need, a, we need a little bit of all of these. And sometimes in our lives, we focus on certain aspects of it over others, but ideally, we want to be able to regularly check holistically where we are. Okay. All right. So, I've given you all the SAMHSA definition of wellness and some ideas that I've had about wellness. And now I'd like for you all to take the time to talk about, does this really encompass what a person of color might need within the wellness sphere? So yes, as human beings, we may all need these things, but are, is there something missing? So um, let's see what time it is, okay. Um, so we'll give you all 10 minutes. I don't know how many people are in the room. There's about 16. So okay, if you 16. wanted to do breakout rooms, you could do eight and eight or just have it here. Okay. Um, I think we can just have the discussion here if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Renee said cultural wellness. Mm. Cultural wellness. Renee, could you speak a little more? <laughs> or do, you can type it in. Absolutely. No. I, I Thank you. Show up in this space. I have my kitty. Um, <laughs> some love. Uh, yes, yes, I love you too. Um, <laughs> So what I mean is just even the even the these spaces, right, where mm -hmm. we can come together um, and and just be in a safe space mm -hmm. um, to be to be. Um, yes. Letting off all the conditioning and the mask of being in predominantly white spaces um, and just being. 
Um, so I feel like that is what's missing um, in, in that SAMHSA wheel. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Renee. I mean, yeah. Piggyback on what Renee said. Um, yes, having the space for us to be, just be, but also having that other persons have enough humility to allow us mm. to be. Because if that doesn't happen, then we can do all, we can have wellness and all the other pieces of that will or attempt to have wellness and all of the other pieces of that will. But the problem is if when we're not allowed to just be ourselves, when we have to conform to the ideal, air, not air quotes, heavy quotes, <laughs> ideal, mm -hmm. then what happens is none of those pieces of the wheel are complete. And we will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we yes. Know, I, I just want to ask us, because I'm just sitting here thinking about as a, a person of color, do I really, because of the uh, ongoing trauma that each and every one of us experience, just just being right, you know, just when you walk in the store or you or you're in a restaurant or I mean, is there a time when we can experience wellness? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's often when we are in our own community spaces. Okay. However, <laughs> I want to throw, throw the however, because of course we have, um, and I can only speak as an African-American woman, a plus size African-American woman. We have sizeism, we have colorism, we have ageism, which also impacts our ability to have wellness mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you know that th there's a it, it's so it's so multi-layered um, mm -hmm. because we have issues within our own community that are compounded by the issues outside of our community that impact our community and a lot of the issues within our community again colorism and and the body size issues are a result of this, this European colonialistic ideal that has become the norm and the accepted um, way of being. So it makes it very hard when you're trying to be well, when you're trying to be well in the workplace, when you're trying to be well in an environment in which you're supposed to be providing tools for people suffering with mental health issues to be well. It's hard to help them be well when you're not well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And I actually found a wheel that had all those isms that you described and it put it actually outside of all of those because those influence our wellness. Um, so I don't think I included in a resource packet, but I will send it. <laughs> So that you all have that, because that is very important. It's the acknowledgement that these oppressive systems in place impact each and every part of it. So to Darlene's point, yes, it may be difficult for us to feel like we can even be well. Can I add something as well? Um, I think that the wheel like it's all well and good like if I, I were just living in a vacuum by myself like, right <laughs> not having to worry about other people but like the other thing that I think and I, I think it gets kind of towards what you were saying about these external factors that we don't really have control over mm -hmm. is you know some people's wellness is presumed to be more important than others mm -hmm. like, you know mm -hmm. when wellness is you know, conceived of in a very specific way that you, that doesn't meet your needs, then it doesn't feel like it gets, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I would mm -hmm. like uh, describe that, but just, yeah, again, kind of getting at those external factors that I don't think are, or that, that might be missing from that graphic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I, I totally appreciate that because it's so true. And that's why I wanted to have this discussion because yeah, it's, um, 
we set this normative view of this is the way wellness should be, but we don't discuss what might get in the way of that. Um, or the fact that maybe our wellness looks a little different because of the oppression that's been experienced. So thank you for that. So, or I was just thinking that maybe the will represents what we want mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that it's the thing that we strive for. And like anything, um, we go in and out. Mm -hmm. You know, one day we get our finances together. Next day, we just, we just a little goofy. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's what it is. And um, maybe when we are in those spaces with people who may not look like us, we um, ground ourselves in what those wills represent. And we remind ourselves because oftentimes, particularly in white spaces, we leave feeling like maybe, maybe I can't do the job or maybe I'm not as good. And so we have to ground ourselves in what we know to be true. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So I, I appreciate that perspective, Debbie, because I think there's, multiple ways that we can interpret these wills. My, the reason why I sometimes use that wheel with clients is because it starts to get us thinking about, okay, wellness is important and I get to decide what that looks like for me. But I know that different aspects of this will pop up in my life. So how I actually define emotional wellness may be different from what they say, but I also know what impacts my emotional wellness. And therefore, when I'm in spaces that may not be contributing to my positive emotional wellness, I can then do what I can to address that, whether it's in that space or whether it's when I'm home. What can I do to make sure that I am meeting my emotional wellness needs? And I think when we look, frame it that way, it can feel very empowering. Any other thoughts on that? Right. Well, thank you all for sharing. That was, I mean, that's really thought provoking. Um, and yes, so. The wellness wheel can be whatever you, you feel is most important to you. Um, but I do think it's very important for us in particular to make sure that we have these markers that we can check in with ourselves on. Shantae, can I ask a question really quickly? Sure. I don't know. I was just listening to the discussion and one of the things that I, it might be embedded in the wheel. Maybe I just didn't see it. And maybe this is too granular, maybe for the next session. But, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I think about too in terms of my wellness is self love. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure where that fits on the wheel, but I think that's important, especially when we live in a society and the norm is something that's different, that looks different than me, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. um, and, re and re remembering like there is self love and mm. you know there's there wasn't a lot of representation without disclosing my age but there wasn't a lot of representation growing up as a child with with dolls or going through the mall and looking at you know the shapes were different you know so just kind of where does that sit because I think that's mm. important too mm. great point and I, I could see that possibly sitting with social my relationship with myself, but it's interpretation, right? Like you could, you could say self-love should be a circle all within itself. Um, I could also see where some people may put that uh, under the emotional wellness. Um, so, but it is a great point. I think that is something that definitely needs to be called out in our communities because of the oppressive systems. So maybe within a BIPOC circle, there would need to be one around self-love or relationship with self, or as I heard earlier, cultural wellness. So 
um, yeah, I appreciate those thoughts on that. All right. So I went and did some very brief research and this is certainly not representative of all of the cultures of the world when it comes to wellness. Actually, cultural wellness is uh, something that's newer in, in research from what I've seen from a, a social psychology perspective. So um, I tried to pull out a few themes that came up um, just to acknowledge that and to also speak to how does this also inform our own sense of wellness, right? So um, a few things came up uh, more than once. So spirituality came up as a big one um, in countries around the world and continents um, as, as a measure of how healthy someone is. So um, wanted to call that out. Culture came up. Um, social harmony came up in quite a few as well. And it's interesting to think about because I, I also wondered then if those are kind of the values, right? Where we put the most, um, if we put most of our weight on spiritual wellness, then that shows also where our values might be. And I think it also shows up in how people develop workplace environments, right? So in certain countries, you're given extended time off um, and things of that nature. And I think that reflects often the values, the dominant culture values there. And similarly here, we see um, wellness is shaped by certain um, dominant cultural values, right? So the idea of social status, um, so that can be finances, that can be, um, um, that can be social wellness. Um, that's often, and we talked about this a little earlier, um, how we're kind of conditioned to frame wellness. So what I thought might be helpful here is if we took a moment to look at our own values. So... I did have a list. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, I'd like for you all to look at this list and choose only one or two of the values listed. So let's see if I can zoom in a bit. And this is from Brene Brown's website. Okay. All right. Sweet. And I can maybe just put this in the chat too. Um, but yeah, take a minute. And if you could only choose one or two values to inform your wellness, which ones would you pick or which one? And feel free to put it in the chat. Shantae, are you sharing your screen or? Oh, no. oh my you... gosh, thank you. I <laughs> thought I was, clearly I was not. Thank you, I appreciate that. Let me share. Okay, uh, screen, okay. All right, can y'all see my screen now? Yes. Perfect, awesome. So now <laughs> choose one or two values to inform your wellness. If you only get one or two. This is very challenging for me because I think I can easily spot 10, but I'm going to hold myself as well to that and put it in the chat. Oh boy, okay. Okay, I'm seeing grace making a difference, humility and grace, uniqueness and authenticity. Oh boy, all right. Um, can 
connection and curiosity. Okay, humility and honesty, hope and wholeheartedness. I chose well-being and wisdom. Compassion, compassion, security. Peace and compassion. All right, 30 seconds. All righty. Balance and loyalty. Thank you all. So how did it feel to, <laughs> to have to choose one or two values here? What, do, what was that like? I'm seeing this is hard. <laughs> Same. Limiting. Tough. Too hard. <laughs> It is very difficult to choose one or two values. But often that can be what we see in the workplace environment. You have a few people who have decided the mission and the vision, which is, are, are ultimately connected to the values of the organization. And it may be one or two values that you may or may not agree with as being the most important. Or they may say that it is, you know, all of these things are our values, right? But when it comes to practice, there may be behaviors that do not reflect that value. So I like to do this exercise because A, I think it's a great way to uh, do some intellectual engagement there, but also it gives us an opportunity to start building those steps to being empowered within ourselves. Um, if I say for me, my most important value, if I had to choose would be well-being, then how do I hold myself accountable to being well, to engaging and well-being, to reflecting that in my work with others, not just with my patients or my clients, but also with my staff and with myself. So it's just a, it's an interesting exercise to do for ourselves, but also something that you can also do with um, thinking about your organization as well. What are our values? And does that align with the behaviors that we engage in? I have a question, Shantae. Yes. Um, so something that I, I struggle with is, is that where the org has a mission and certain values that on paper and outside of the org look really great, mm -hmm. but internally those values aren't practiced with staff. And so how do you, how do you, how do you navigate that? That is a great question. Um, and, and that is actually, I jumped ahead of myself because that's actually one of what I like to call a workplace hazard. When there's a misalignment between the values that we say we have, but we don't actually do that with our staff, right? Maybe we show it to our patients, maybe our clients but we don't show it to each other. And I, I think that is a very challenging space to be in. Something that I've, I try to practice in my day-to-day -day work is where can I call that out? You know, and sometimes the framing of that looks different depending on who I talk to, right? Like, you know, if I'm, if I am talking with my supervisor, it may be, 
kind of an exploratory, like, you know, help me understand this because I'm having some trouble here. Um, in other spaces, it may be me saying, this is what I see happening. And this is what we say we're about. So, and I, and I, I, I recognize that there has to be a certain sense of safety within that. So I, I <laughs> For me, I tend to be the type of person where I'm like, if I don't say something, that's not gonna sit well with my soul. So, so I need to say something, even if it means people are gonna be mad and maybe a little uncomfortable. But um, I, I recommend that people find where is your, what I call the growth zone? Where do you feel like, okay, yes, I can speak up because this is important to me. So I have to find a way to speak up and express myself and also, I acknowledge that I need to also make sure that I'm not overextending myself to the point where I'm doing harm to myself. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> no, it's helpful to, to think about. Yeah, for sure. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so for this next part, going into the workplace wellness aspect, can folks just kind of put in the chat your roles so I get an idea of where people are professionally? Okay, community health worker, okay. Community health workers, all right. Clinic manager. Clinic pro clinical program planner. Directors, epidemiologists. Oh. Equity and workforce specialists, all right. Okay, so we have pretty diverse group here. Remote therapist, family coach, okay. All right, so we have quite a few direct service as, uh, healthcare providers. And then we have some administrators as well. Okay, all right. Thank you all for that. And that's actually, there's a reason for that. <laughs> it's going to kind of help frame how I move forward with the rest of the presentation um, when we're talking about action steps to create those safe spaces within the workplace. So thank you all for that. Okay. So workplace safety, occupational wellness, all of those things would fit here. So what are the hazards to that? Hazards, <laughs> bias, um, having unrealistic expectations set upon us. So um, as a social worker, I can say there's definitely been spaces that I've been in where it's been, we need to get this many people housed and keep them housed. And yes, that sounds great, but if we're not actually addressing some other issues, is that a realistic expectation? And what impact is that having on me as the staff person? So that can be a hazard. Not being acknowledged um, for the things maybe that you're bringing up around concerns or things being overlooked. So as we were talking about earlier, if I am in a leadership position and my perspective on health, on wellness is different from my staff who are maybe doing the direct service work and are seeing this with their patients or their clients, then I may be, if I'm not careful as a leader, I may say, 
but that doesn't really matter, right? Like that's not actually part of the wellness. And so it's that dismissive, dismissive behavior can be a hazard to our workplace wellness. We talked about this one before, the misalignment between the mission, the mission, the values that an organization holds, and then the actual work, the behaviors that we show. Um, and then other systems of oppression. So having microaggressions occur. So, um, you know, there's a lot of examples of that, right? Um, you know, being told that, oh, you know, you're a doctor of color, good for you, or something, you know, something of that nature, right? Or, you know, you know, as maybe I'm a woman and because I'm a woman and a minority in that way, I say, I get what you're going through and I'm, I may not be a person of color. So, or I may say, you know, you know, the infamous, you know, oh, you know, I just, you know, maybe I touch your hair or things of that nature. So these are microaggressions that pop up and over time, can be hazardous to our health, can, can impact our own sense of safety within the workspace. And then we have gaslighting that occurs as well. Uh, I, uh, examples of this would be, oh, you didn't hear me right. Or, you know, that's not exactly what happened. Things that make you question your sense of self, right? Um, that's definitely also a hazard. Are there any other hazards that you all have seen in your work? It's a very short list. <laughs> and I could definitely go on with examples, but I'm also looking at the time. So if there's anything that you all feel like has really shown up in your work um, as a hazard, please feel free uh, to come off mute or put in the chat. I think being the only one, the only person mm. um, of color in an organization mm. as a Yeah. So how is that a hazard for you? Well, I'm not the only one, but I do mm -hmm. think that when you don't have people who share some comp that you have this, sort of this commonality um, where you can show up just to be yourself um, and you're always the one who's having to explain mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what I'm hearing is when there's more than one there's typically a general understanding yes yeah absolutely and, you know, Shante and, and Debbie, that's exactly what I've seen a lot in a lot of BIPOC leaving the workforce because in a lot of, if you were the only one, a lot of times you get the clients that are BIPOC and that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the expectation mm -hmm. in the workplace is if you have a BIPOC patient and you're the only BIPOC provider, that's a lot to carry and a high expectation. And yeah. Yep. And we have, yeah. a, we have a system that's based on middle-class values. And so we're always trying to, you know, fit our, we try to fit those that we work with in that box too. Yep. Yep. Yes. That's all so real. And definitely things that happen all over various systems. And it does make it difficult to continue in this work. Let me check the chat. Burnout, mm-hmm. Yeah, so hazards if left unchecked can lead to burnout, can lead to, um, harm can lead to trauma all of the, can lead to us overall not feeling well I, I cannot say how many clients I've had come in 
who specifically wanted to work on workplace wellness because it was impacting all other aspects of their life to such a severe degree. And it makes sense. We spend so much time doing this work. And so of course it would have a profound impact on our overall sense of wellness. So protective factors. These are very general. <laughs> um, and also some, one of these may not outweigh others, right? So for example, benefits. And this one I hear a lot from corporations and that, oh, well, we give good time off, right? Yeah, but what about when we have to come back to work? So, so I say some of these can be protective factors, but it depends on the individual context. So um, a few things that I look at um, when I'm working with leaders is, yes, exactly. PTO does not fix burnout. Um, transparency. Can I, as a leader, tell the truth about what is happening within the organization? instead of putting on maybe a false pretense that it's just you. And to me, that's kind of like a gaslighting experience. Um, so I, I encourage the sense of transparency. Um, also the culturally cultural humility. Not saying that because you are a person of color, you should have all of the people of color on your caseload. Um, because of course you'd want to work, work with your folks. Um, and not assuming that I know anything <laughs> about um, how you experience your life as a person of color. And I, and I, as a clinician of color, I also um, practice this with my clients in general too. I don't assume that I know anything about folks. Um, Instead, I am here, I want to learn so that we can collaborate better. Um, and also to the point of being the only one as a hazard, having affirming spaces, seeing leadership that is diverse um, and having access to that leadership to being able to have conversations and influence. Um, to continue to build more affirming spaces. And also having healthy supports. So um, for my clients that work in predominantly white spaces, they work really hard to make sure that they have a circle, a BIPOC circle for themselves that they can go to and say, this is what happened to me. And that space says, you're not crazy, you're not alone. So I, I think that's, that is a powerful tool. Um, and just um, being here today and built, starting to build communities, that helps us further the goal of creating those affir affirming spaces. And also too, um, showing up. I didn't put this on here, but that's a big part too. Um, when you feel like someone is exhibiting a microaggression or trying to gaslight you, being able to identify that and say, this is, this is what this feels like to me and calling it for what it is, is empowering and it also creates the space for the potential of a cultural shift within the organization. Doesn't mean that it will happen for the entire department or group, but it starts to make space for that. Are there any examples of protective factors um, within maybe you all's organizations or things that y'all have thought about? Oh. 
Um, I, I think having like a, either a coach or accountability mm-hmm. partner, mm-hmm. someone who, when you have those moments, if you're like, I'm going to go sister on somebody that you can, you know, have a conversation first. Yes. Yes. I, I, I have a friend that I will text <laughs> like, like, okay. I just want to let you know it, it's at that point. And I'm like, okay, we know. And we're going to reel it in just a little bit because, you know, you like working. <laughs> so, but yes, absolutely. Having a partner. That's great. Anything else? So um, our agency, uh, we used to have caucus. Mm. um caucuses and and but I think Debbie you were speaking to how even within our own groups there's a lot of colorism racism Mm -hmm. and and uh, not racism ageism um in in the in the groups and um so they they actually stopped it and and so we haven't had the uh our caucuses in a long time Mm. and so um as the lead in on on my team um we created a weekly um, Mm check-in um with the with the BIPOC staff so on on Fridays um (laughs) Friday afternoons we kind of (laughs) close the week Okay. Um, to go into the weekend and just have just have just titles aside and just come come to this space as you are and how the week went for you um I I feel it, it's been super healing and 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 mm-hmm. just great for for me um as a person in the agency who has felt very alone um mm-hmm. And so having, having more BIPOC people on the team, um, Kayla's here, shout out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, that's, so that's what we we've tried to do, even though I've received a lot of pushback Mm. and, (laughs) and, um, language trying to convince me why that meeting is problematic and so I'm pretty much like okay well if you tell me I can't have these meetings anymore then we'll just do it during our lunch you can't tell me anything right right and I, and I said that thankfully but um it was again brought up this week about so I'm wondering yeah. how, how if this is taken away from us, basically, mm-hmm. how how we can how we can continue creating that safe space mm-hmm. during the work time. Yeah. Well, first off. I'm so glad that you and your team have that space right now and you all are dedicated to that space because it's needed. And, you know, the issue sometimes with caucuses and all that is, like you said, the isms come up and they're not called out, right? Like there's not a system of accountability. I think um, something that I work a lot with with groups is how do we create norms so that we do have a space where people feel safe Mm-hmm. and also <laughs> accountable. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of where I think about with that. But with your group, I, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep my professional hat on because I definitely have my own opinion about um, when folks say, oh, that, that's not okay because maybe it's exclusive or whatnot. Um, to me, that can feel like a form of gaslighting, honestly. But (laughs) um, so I I think 
there are several ways to go about that. Um, first of all, are there any champions within the organization that might be able to support you in that, right? So, no, uh, yes, maybe. I don't. <laughs> I've, I have put out bids okay, okay. Out, outside of my program. Um, okay and have been unsuccessful. <laughs> okay, 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 and there, there may not be, there may not be, unfortunately. Um, and, and also it's unfortunate that some of our BIPOC leadership are not on board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so okay. that's really hard yeah. getting that information from people who look like you. Yes, yeah, that's, that's another layer of hurt. Um, if there aren't any champions that you are aware of, then I like to look at what is what is the argument? What is the reasoning that they're giving for this is not okay? And then is there evidence of where this has worked elsewhere? Because at the end of the day, organizations, I think understand to a certain extent that these systems are oppressive. <laughs> And, you know, a lot of organizations will say we want more BIPOC folks. You know, that's the, that's the trend now. But do we know, we, they don't know what it's like to be a BIPOC uh, in that, you know, mostly white space. They don't understand it. So then it's up to us to say, well, what is the reasoning? So whatever their reason is, and then this is what research right has shown this is what and th and things are coming out now thankfully but yeah so you 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 frame an argument um in the way that they maybe perhaps can understand because i'm very passionate and i can say look y'all wrong this is wrong <laughs> and, and express that but sometimes they don't necessarily hear that and then it becomes oh you're just being an angry black woman things of that nature you know like just yes. yeah exactly so <laughs> so I, I first of all, I acknowledge how I feel and I make sure that I affirm myself and that I have supports that are like, okay, I get that. I get you. I see you. And then I say, okay, now that I'm at a level where I can kind of think about this, can I present an argument to them? Now I shouldn't have to, but since, since, and especially since you're in a leadership role, that happens sometimes, right? So well, that's the thing, Shantae, is I feel like I'm constantly mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. explaining the method behind my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. And, and it's, it, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Absolutely. Um, but I think the more we continue to have those conversations, and maybe it's not just you, right? Maybe, you know, you're talking with your team about it. And they're like, look, I found this information too. Yeah. Because it is a heavy load to carry. Um, yep. Maybe that'll help that. But nonetheless, even if they still say no, like you said, you all can do it on your lunch break. Yeah. So I, I think that's the, the recognition that at the end of the day, we still have some power. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, how we keep moving forward when we know it's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm definitely going to get my research and frame my argument. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. And feel free, like I said, feel free to email me. I, I, I'm always like, hmm, what, what can I find? Because yes, I understand. All right. Uh oh, I don't know what time it is. Okay, we got six minutes. Okay. Um. <laughs> So I'm going to scoot along. So I thought this was interesting uh, because it kind of, it to me, this person, and I, I recognize that we can't always take two days working in healthcare, right? And two more days to reflect. But the, the fact of the matter is this person felt comfortable to say, look, this is, <laughs> this is my norm. And maybe we can't do that to that level but maybe we can define our own norm and say, this is where I stand. Um, and if you can't meet that, then maybe I need to be in a different space. 
I don't know, but I do think we need to create that norm for ourselves. Uh, we talked about that. So moving forward, what is something that we can commit to doing to improve our workplace wellness or, or, or even our own sense of wellness in general? Look in the chat. Um, let's see, we have a, a DEI committee, and when sometimes, sometimes, sometimes have open sessions specifically when hate crimes happen. That's awesome. Exercise grace with ourselves and others. Yes, yes, yes. We are so conditioned to put so much weight on ourselves with all the expectations. And sometimes we just get so caught up in, well, I have to keep doing this. I mean, I, I work with some very passionate people that are like, you know, this is my people. These are my, this is my community. I got to keep pushing. And then they end up oppressing themselves. So exercise that grace to yourselves and then also give that to others. Set boundaries. Yes, that, that, you know, that email <laughs> signature, that's a boundary. We have to define the line somewhere. And that's why I highly recommend you all creating your own wellness system, whether you use the wellness wheel and, and edit it for your own use or whatnot. But um, that's important because then that says, okay, this is where I need to draw the line because this is negatively impacting my sense of wellness. Anything else? All right. Okay. So we are running out of time, but um, in your resources that you'll get afterwards, there is a wellness assessment tool that you can use. Add your own questions <laughs> if you feel appropriate. Um, but hopefully that'll give you an idea of kind of where you are um, in each area. And maybe you say, I want to really work on my emotional wellness because that is greatly impacted in the workplace or whatnot. Um, but that could be a good way to start building that framework. Um, you can create your own sanctuary. So <laughs> I had a client who said, I really, when I get really upset, I'm in my office and I need to sit on the floor. And that's what they do. So, so they got a nice rug and that is what they do. So take uh, what you can to empower yourself to create that space. Some things we are out of control of. I'm not, I'm not gonna say that we, <laughs> we can just say, you know what, you all are wrong and this is the right way to treat us. And then they're gonna say, okay, great. It's not reality. But there are things that we can do to create safe spaces for ourselves. Uh, and show up, allow yourself to be authentically you as much as you feel safe to do so. So once again, and we'll talk about this more in the next session, growth zone. What do I have the courage to do today without sacrificing myself, right? So you have to be careful there, but sometimes it's just today, I'm going to say something to that person that keeps uh, gaslighting me, or I'm going to call out the microaggression that I'm experiencing. Or I'm going to talk to one of my friends about it and see if they can hear that too. Um, you can also, if you find that you want to do some deeper work, you can find a mental health professional. Um, you can pay attention to those hazards and protective factors um, and really engage the spaces differently. Like we were talking about earlier, 
if you have some position of authority, use that. If you have some privilege, use that to help create the spaces that you seek to be in. If you usually don't speak up, say something. And of course that's easier said than done, but I think it's just really important that we also make sure that we have the courage to do it. And we also are mindful that if we're always the one doing it, it's tiring. Maybe it's who can support me too. And give yourself an opportunity to rest. So we are out of time, but this is my contact information. Uh, are there any last minute thoughts, questions, comments? Um, I just want to say it was it was refreshing for me to see that even though we're like all over the country, that we all deal with the same exact things no matter where we are, because mm -hmm. a lot of times we do kind of feel alone and siloed. Mm -hmm. um, like it's just you and your organization, but it's just good. It's good to see. I mean, good and bad in a way. <laughs> it's good to yeah. see that it's just not, you know, it's just not here, you know. So I appreciate that. Yep, you you are not alone. <laughs> We're all trying to figure this out. So thank you. Anybody else? Say, planning just with Shante these series. I know Darlene, myself, and I, when we were planning those meeting. It was just sanctuary for me to be in the space with Shantae and kind of thinking about all this space. And so I just want to thank you, Shantae, for, for your expertise and your thoughtfulness and kindness. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's it's therapeutic for me as well. <laughs> Anybody else? Just want to echo thanks and gratitude for this space. I'm excited for the next one. And I mean, I, I want to offer my contact information for um, if anyone would like to reach out just as another person in part of your community. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to put it in the chat, I think, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I think that's what we're trying to do, right? Build that community across the country. So thank you for that. All right. All right, great. We, we, do have, we do have an evaluation that we need folks to do. If okay, we get off of this. That's okay. Yes, thank you, Brandon. Yeah, it's just a quick poll. There's just a couple of questions before you all leave. If you could just fill this out, uh, we would appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for joining us. Yes, and um, as you're filling out this poll, thank you. This is also helpful for us to report back to our um, to HERS as well. But I just want to give you a heads up that we hope to continue engaged with you. Like I said, between sessions, next session is February third, um, and hopefully we'll be sending out some um, communication and continuous ways for us to engage um, between those sessions. So thank you guys so much, and thank you for completing the the poll for us. <laughs> Yes. yes, thank you. You all created this space, so thank you so much. And please, please do something kind for yourself this weekend. You all deserve that, so. That's right. All right, take care. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.